Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Congresswoman Kirsten Sinema will join us to talk about immigration reform, gun control, and other issues facing Arizona. And a critic of the conservative lobbying group ALEC will be here to talk about what some see as the group's excessive influence at the state legislature. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tempe will take on the issue of civil unions tonight during the city council's private executive session. Council member Colby Granville says he wants his city to be the first in the valley to approve civil unions. This all follows the actions of the Bisbee City Council, which approved a civil union ordinance earlier this week, a move that State Attorney General Tom Horn says is unconstitutional. And the Arizona Board of Regents today raised tuition at Arizona's three universities. The Regents increased tuition by 3% for in-state freshmen at ASU and the U of A, with a 5% increase for incoming freshmen at NAU. Now, under the new rates, tuition will hit $10,000 a year for the first time at ASU. U of A will reach $10,400, with NAU at just under $10,000 a year. The new rates will take effect this fall. Representative Kirsten Sinema won a tough, narrowly decided race to become Arizona's newest member of the congressional delegation. She serves in District 9, which covers parts of Phoenix, Scottsdale, Tempe, Chandler, and Mesa. Kirsten Sinema joins me now to talk about a range of issues facing Arizona and the nation. Good to see you again. Thanks it's for great joining to be us. here. Um, there's so much going on, and it seems like immigration has kind of taken a lead here. The reform ideas are out there. I know the Senate's got the, 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 the gang of aid going here. Is, is, is something happening in the House that you hear? Absolutely. Now, the House process is getting a little bit less attention, but it's actually a little bit farther down the road. You can expect to see some legislation come out of the House sometime in the next several weeks. The legislation in the House covers the same broad principles as you hear in the Senate. It addresses three issues, border security, future flow, so addressing how we let immigrants into work and when and in what numbers, and the third issue, of course, is settling the status of the people who are already here, the dreamers, the folks who've been here working for many years. Is uh, compared to what you're hearing from the Senate, the Gang of Eight over there? Well, the House version is different in that it'll likely be a package of several bills that'll each be voted on independently. But it does include significant funding and support for border security. It does address a market-based system to allow individuals to come into this country to work when we have jobs available. And it does provide paths to citizenship for people who are already here who want to get right with the law and get on the path to American citizenship. Does that path or any aspect of the House plan involve returning to one's home country, reapplying, reentering? Much of that is still under debate. And so that may be the case for some, maybe not for others. That part hasn't been completely decided yet. And, and as far as like a new visa program for low-skilled workers, first of all, do you think that's a good idea? And secondly, there seems to be a dispute over the wages for some of these workers. Well, that's the Gang of Eight proposal. So the Gang of Eight in the Senate has proposed a new visa called the W visa. It would eliminate a temporary visa, allow folks to get a one-year worker visa with the option to turn that into a longer-term path to either legal permanent residency or eventually citizenship. There are some debates around what the wages would look like and whether or not that visa would be attached to a certain employer. Again, that's in the Senate, so it's a different discussion that's happening in the House. In the House, I think there's some acknowledgement that some people want to be temporary workers, seasonal workers, and others are interested in more long-term paths to not only working, but some, a path to citizenship. And, and when the two uh, likely eventually mix along those That's lines, right. what would your thoughts be, though, regarding, again, Democrats are kind of coming at this from higher wages for fewer workers. Republicans are seeing more workers, lower wages. Well, I support and always have supported a market-based approach. The idea that instead of having rigid quotas to allow certain numbers of people in every year, that we instead adjust the number of visas that we allow in based on the market needs. So when we have a big need in one industry, we bring in more folks from, for that industry. When we have less of a need, we bring in less folks. It's a more dynamic approach and meets the real, real market requirements of our country. Last question on this. Uh, border security. I'm not going to ask you what a secure border looks like. I'm tired of asking that question. Nobody knows. No one seems to have an answer. <laughs> but how do you better improve security at the border? Well, one of the ways to address it is to create a future flow for legal folks to come in through a door, create a door for good people to come in and get jobs. Right now, Border Patrol can't tell the difference between a good guy and a bad guy on the border because a guy coming across with drugs looks the same as a guy who's coming across to work. But if you have a path for some people to come to work legally, 
then the folks who will be coming through illegally are mostly here for bad purposes. So it becomes easier to target and interdict the bad guys. Um, but, you know, we've seen some success in the Yuma sector. We're still struggling in the Tucson sector. So we have to keep experimenting and trying to figure out how we can crack down on the folks who are doing dangerous things, smuggling drugs and guns and people for illicit purposes. I keep hearing the Yuma sector is a success. Let's put it over in the Tucson sector. Is that viable? Well, I'm not an expert on this issue, but there are some real differences in terms of geography. Mm -hmm. The Yuma sector is a much more dangerous sector. And frankly, the risk of death and dying and, is much higher in Yuma. And so some of the tools, I think, could probably be replicated, but every area is a little bit different. Let's get to sequestration and the impact on your district. Uh, and, and what the heck is going on back there <laughs> to get this figured out? Well, the first thing to note is that sequestration has gone into effect. And folks will continue to feel the rollout of sequestration over the coming months. As furloughs are being implemented in the military, as we're seeing pay cuts happening across the board, as we see reduction in services. So the sequestration is very real. And fortunately, the government has taken some action to reduce some of the negative impacts, though I believe it's not enough. We passed a continuing resolution two weeks ago that alleviates the impact of the sequester on the military, veterans, the criminal justice system, and our agricultural community. It doesn't eliminate the bad stuff, but it lessens it. It's a step forward. It also prevented government shutdown, but there's still much work to do. And frankly, we're still waiting for some bipartisan action here. Um, I know that Republicans are big on addressing things like Social Security and Medicare and debt services. Uh, can those things be addressed, or is this such gridlock that you got... I, I keep hearing there's bipartisan action going on. There is. That's, well, they have not seen a heck of a lot of results <laughs> here across the continent. So, I mean, are, are you willing to listen to addressing, uh, raising the retirement age? Is that something you would listen to? Well, and actually, I am part of a group called, well, we were called the Gang of 32, but there's a lot of gangs in Congress, you may have noticed. We've now formed a group called the United Solutions Caucus. 36 Republicans and Democrats in the freshman class joined together. We issued a joint statement where we called for a grand bargain to address long-term issues like preserving and strengthening Social Security and Medicare, ensuring they're solvent in the future, and also addressing revenue, addressing loopholes, addressing infrastructure. And we said we're willing to take bipartisan action to solve this problem instead of kicking the can down the road. Now what we've asked most recently is for leadership in both parties to meet with us to talk about actually solving the problem. Unfortunately, what we hear in Congress is a lot of attacking each other and blaming each other, which of course doesn't solve anything. Are you hearing more of that, less of that? What's going on? Well, you know, I'm spending my time with folks who want to find a bipartisan solution. And the good news is our ranks are growing. And what we're seeking to do is attract more and more folks from higher ranks of power. I mean, we're freshmen, but we're trying to get folks who've been there longer to join us in this effort to solve the problem. I got to tell you, Ted, everywhere I go in the district, that's what I hear about. People want us to solve the problem. They don't care if it's a Republican solution or a Democratic solution. They just want the problem fixed. But there are some out there who say they look at, especially the sequestration business, this was supposed to be such a, a <laughs> radical idea that no one would even remotely consider it. It's a done deal. Yes. Um, is Congress serious about this? You know, there are some people who are, and I certainly can't speak for everyone. But I can tell you that in this freshman class, both Republican and Democrat, we are folks who come from our communities. We're fresh-faced, we've got new ideas, and most importantly, we're problem solvers. We have a history of being problem solvers when we served in our state legislatures, our city councils, or as business leaders in our community. And so we believe that it's our job to help kind of allow other folks to reflex their muscles of bipartisanship, get back in the method. They've done it before. They can do it again. Are they willing to do it again? And you talked about leadership. I mean, are, are you getting near there, or is this as much a, a gang of fill-in-the-blank just kind of doing their own thing? <laughs> no, no. You know, when we presented our ideas to both sets of leadership, they encouraged us and asked us to continue working. And so we believe that this change has to come from the bottom up in Congress. It has to be from those of us who are new, who haven't, you know, gone Washington. Those of us who are still interested in making change, we're the ones who are going to help do it. Uh, the president is out there now talking about gun control, uh, gun control uh, issues, and he says we're not going to wait for another new town. Uh, do you agree? And if so, explain, please. Well, I do believe that most Americans agree throughout this country, including here in Arizona, that there are some common sense actions we can take. For instance, right now, 40 percent of all gun sales happen outside of a background check. Now, that's a little bit nerve wracking because bad guys who get a hold of guns and do bad things with them usually do it outside of a background check. 
So one common sense proposal that I've long supported is to ensure that all gun sales and gun transfers happen with a background check. And there's a proposal in both the Senate and the House to do that. I support that. What about the idea that background checks would just simply push the bad guys to black market sales, and maybe some not so bad guys to black market sales, that you're, not, you're just not going to stop it? Well, it's true that bad guys will always do bad things, but when law enforcement can tell the difference between a bad guy and a good guy, it's easier to interdict and stop those people. So when good guys are getting their gun sales done through background checks, it's easier to catch the bad guys because there's fewer of those left. Some of those good guys, though, are concerned about a firearms registry. How do you keep that from happening with universal background checks? Oh, you know, that's a really good point. You can do a universal background check, and as soon as the check's done, eliminate the data. Um, that's very simple to do, and that's actually one of the proposals we see in Congress is today. That, is that something, though, that you think people will uh, buy? I mean, a lot of folks are going to say, you can, you, I'm not buying that. They're not going to get rid of that data. <laughs> Well, it's healthy to be skeptical of government. The best way to ensure that that doesn't happen is through checks and balances. Assault, Let's have some accountability. Assault weapons ban for it? You know, I think the assault weapons ban is not likely to come for a vote in the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate. It doesn't seem to be a, 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 enough folks on both sides of the aisle to get this done. And you know me, Ted. I'm one who always deals in the world of the possible. So I'm really focused on trying to get done what we can get done to not only protect civil liberties and protect the Second Amendment, but also protect families and kids. Last question on this. Uh, critics of, of any kind of uh, gun reform here say that gun ownership is up uh, and, and gun violence has actually, for the past 20 some odd years, been down according to FBI statistics. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that argument? Well, that's great news. That means we're doing something right in this country. I still think it makes sense to take some common sense measures. For instance, in Arizona, we have a gun show loophole where you can go to a gun show, purchase as many weapons as you want, and if you're one of those straw trafficker guys, you can turn right around and sell those guns to people who don't have the legal right to have them. Felons, people who are doing bad things. I think closing that loophole makes sense, regardless of the level of violence that we've seen. We don't want guns in the hands of bad people. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, last question here. I know that you gave a state of the, uh, of the district uh, right. address here. And, and again, it sounds like you're pushing again for bipartisanship. You're pushing again for the, it, the mayors of, of the, the cities that you represent to get together and work together. Are they willing to do that, or are we still seeing some, uh, some of the old regionalism going on? Well, I've got to tell you, these mayors are some of the best mayors in the state. You've got Mayor Stanton. Mayor Smith, Mayor Tibshraney, Mayor Lane, and Mayor Mitchell. And these guys are talking together on a regular basis. Before I even took office, we got together in Tempe and had a meeting and started brainstorming how I could be of service to them in their work together. It's tremendous, the work they're doing together. Not just around things like transit and public safety, but even around economic regionalism. Growing technology companies, biotech, incubating centers of innovation. They're doing some amazing work. I see my job as helping them do that work and facilitate facilitating that effort. What are they asking you to do now that you've been in office? Well, one of the things they're asking me to help do is identify grants. Because of sequester and because of diminishing monies that are coming from the federal government to local governments, they're working hard to earn monies from the government in the form of grants. So our office is going to start helping them identify grants and help facilitate them applying for and hopefully getting some of these merit-based grants. So you're not seeing and perhaps as much provincialism as we tend to think is out there regarding these cities? Because you, not with these you can't even get them together on Papago Park, a new plan <laughs> for uh, Papago Park. But you're saying you're seeing some cooperation Oh, here. these guys are great. I mean, they get together. In fact, many of the East Valley city mayors were all together just yesterday talking about some regionalism that they're working on together. They're doing a great job, and I'm just proud to be a part of their team. Last question here. Uh, biggest challenge you've found since going back to Washington? Well, I'll tell you the truth. You spend a lot of time walking from one building to the next. And, Ted, you know me. I'm very efficient. So I started having meetings while I'm walking from one building to the next so as not to waste the time. That's the biggest challenge I've seen. If the lay of the land is the biggest challenge for you, goodness good gracious. Shape. All right. Uh, it's good to see you again. Thanks <laughs> for joining us. Here. We appreciate it. Thanks so much.
get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. ALEC is an acronym that stands for the American Legislative Exchange Council, a public-private membership association of corporate interests and state lawmakers. Critics say ALEC has too much influence at state capitals across the country, but others see ALEC as little more than a way for lawmakers and business interests to meet and share ideas. National Common Cause President and CEO Bob Edgar presented a new report on ALEC-backed legislation introduced in Arizona this year, and he joins me now to talk about what he sees as the influence of ALEC on the Arizona State Legislature. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining it's us. It's nice to be here. Give me a better definition of ALEC. ALEC is an association of about 2,000 conservative state representatives from across the country who meet several times a year in some of the most fancy resorts and uh, fancy spas, and they meet with about 250 corporations, sit side by side, they have eight task forces. Nothing happens unless the corporate leaders agree to let it happen. They put model legislation together, and then they come back to states like Arizona, which is the poster child for where ALEC works, and here in this state, they have these model bills that they put in place. Now, that's not a bad thing to do. If you're conservative, uh, that's okay. But for 40 years, they've been organized and filing with the IRS as a charity. Every contribution given uh, is tax deductible. And corporations who give hundreds of thousands of dollars for these fancy events to lobby. I spent 12 years as a member of Congress. I know what lobbying looks like. Uh, your former a guest who's a congresswoman, she's finding out what lobbying is like. These folks are professional lobbyists who want to corporatize democracy, want to move democracy more into the private sector, and they ought to be honest about the fact that it is hardcore lobbying, and they put on their tax filing, they do zero lobbying, and they tell the world, and, and here's the point that impacts on average ordinary citizens, we pay for it. That is, as taxpayers, every time somebody defrauds the tax code, as Alec has done. And Bill Moyers did a video, which we showed to almost 200 people last night here in Arizona. We're showing it in every state capital so that average ordinary citizens can make the connection between their legislators being wined and dined and accepting gifts that they can't accept in their own states and, and also what Alec is doing to influence public policy. You use the word fraud. If, if, it's, if it's that clear, and if it is fraud, where's the IRS? Where's the federal government on this? Well, we found inside the IRS there's a whistleblower agency that is mandated to investigate tax fraud. So Bob Edgar, that is myself, and my wife Merle, we filed a whistleblower complaint with the IRS. We gave the IRS only 4,800 documents. Uh, we handed it over last May. And they've been researching those documents and showing the difference between what they claim on their tax forms and what they, uh, what they actually do. And inside this agency, if we're right and our legal counsel says that this is the strongest tax fraud case that they've seen, if we're right and the IRS comes out and concludes that we're right, then ALEC and the corporations that are paying into ALEC will be subject to penalties and fines into the millions of dollars. Last year, in the Trayvon Martin shooting, the ALEC came to the fore in the New York Times and Washington Post because the shooter claimed the Stand Your Ground law. And that law was invented by the, IR, by the uh, Rifle Association, installed in Florida, and then spread through ALEC across the country. And that's when ALEC came out of the shadows and became very much uh, a, a popular name and word. Well, it's interesting you mentioned coming out of the shadows because a year or so ago, Alec had a national conference here in Arizona, and one of our state lawmakers, we had her on the show, Representative Debbie Lesko, she's the, uh, uh, the Alec Arizona state chairman, and we talked to her about Alec, and uh, among the things we asked was whether or not Alec had uh, more influence than it should have, or at least more than the average Joe or Jane at the state legislature. I want you to listen to what she had to say. Yep. So when critics say that ALEC means too much corporate benefit, not enough public benefit, you say 
I say ALEC is a great group. They bring legislators together to talk about pension reform, fiscal responsibility, improving education. It's a great forum. I think it's the strength of ALEC that businesses and legislators can meet together, share ideas, create jobs. Is that a disproportionate strength, considering 50 of the 90 lawmakers down there are members of ALEC? I mean, I'm uh, very good at recruiting ALEC members. Apparently you are. Yes. But, but, but again, is the proportion healthy for Arizona? Yes, it's healthy because all the issues we talk about are issues that our Arizona citizens, mo a vast majority, support. I mean, they want to make sure that we're fiscally responsible. We talk a lot about that issue at ALEC. They want their for state rights. We talk a lot about that issue at ALEC. I mean, they're just good, solid issues that our citizens support. Good, good, solid issues, a give and take of ideas, a chance to meet with business interests. What can be wrong with that? Arizona is the poster child for how they've been consumed by the ALEC influence. For example, for-profit prisons have been established and ALEC has spread those across the country and filling them with persons where they get money per diem for uh, putting people in those prisons that have been overbuilt. Uh, education, they've been trying to weaken public education and we did a lot of research uh, in these uh, whistleblower complaint that we sent in uh, we found inside of ALEC they're manipulating these legislators to think that they're doing the public's good. And your voters here in Arizona need to ask the 50 uh, legislators that are part of ALEC, do you represent us as individuals, as democracy is supposed to represent, or do you represent Exxon and BP? Do you represent the energy interest and the health care interest? Uh, Forty corporations since the Trayvon Martin shooting have fled ALEC because they don't want to be identified with ALEC. Many corporations that don't care about their brand identity have stayed and they want to use ALEC almost like a stealth bomber to be able to lobby inside the state legislatures without labeling it lobbying. Is there though a, a, a liberal version of this? And I ask this because I've heard of the Progressive States Network, PSN, mm -hmm. um, apparently union backed and there's some thought and some critics of PSN say that they're more secretive than ALEC out there and it's harder to find out who's funding and who's running that group which drafts model legislation for liberal lawmakers around the country. Common Cause has been around for 40 years and we try to be a watchdog, a good government uh, group looking at both liberals and, and conservatives. The difference is if you give $25,000 to ALEC on April 15th you can take it off on your income tax. If you give $25,000 to the group that you mentioned that would be illegal because they file properly with the IRS and you don't get a tax break. So the taxpayers are supporting and funding and subsidizing ALEC the taxpayers aren't subsidizing these other groups. Also, in ALEC, corporations have equal influence with the state legislators. In these other groups, they'll invite corporations in to give their talking points and their point of view, but they don't let them control the outcome. So is it your main concern not so much the influence that they have at the legislature because let's face it some folks are voting in conservative lawmakers because they're conservative they like their That's viewpoints. Fine. It's not so much that you're saying it's the tax exempt status it's the unwillingness to say you really are a lobbying group. Right. If I'm General Electric I want to get access to all of these state legislators. ALEC is a great opportunity to do it and then I get a bonus by being able to take off every dollar I give to ALEC as a tax deduction. Uh, that's a pretty good thing. It's, a, it's actually lobbying on the cheap. And I think what your constituents here in Arizona want, they want their representatives to come to the state capitol and do the best job they can. Listen not only to corporations, but listen to all sides of a particular issue. And they want lobbyists to be known, registered, and not hiding in the shadows. All right. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. We you. appreciate it. Great to be with you. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists Roundtable. We'll look at the battle to expand the state's Medicaid program. And Attorney General Tom Horn says he's ready to sue the city of Bisbee over its civil unions ordinance. Those stories and more Friday on the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now.
I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.